Hello and welcome to today's Paycom webinar, Real Talk on Employee Purpose and Values with Jen Lim. Last year, Gallup surveyed more than 57,000 full and part-time employees and only 34% reported feeling engaged at work, while another 16% said they were actually actively disengaged. Moreover, according to the firm, 2021 was the first time in a decade that engagement dropped year over year. And as a result of these circumstances, human resource professionals have been given the tall task of not only re-engaging, but also retaining employees during what's looking like the biggest slump in over a decade. This has now made employee happiness not only a topic of discussion, but imperative for success. Now in just a moment, I will formally introduce our featured guests as well as dive into today's topic. But first, I wanna make you aware of a few important notes about this presentation. If you're looking to learn more about today's topic or about employee happiness or anything further, we have loaded you up with access to several great resources, so please be sure to check those out. And then finally, just a quick disclaimer, the content of this webinar is intended to keep interested parties informed of legal and industry developments for educational purposes only. It is not intended as legal opinion or tax advice and should not be regarded as a substitute for such. Now, without further ado, let's go ahead and turn it over and see who our host is today. Joining me as co-host is Jen Lim. So a little bit about Jen. Jen is the fearless, innovative CEO and co-founder of DH. From her 20 plus years of lessons learned in culture and consulting, the proven results from transforming company cultures come back to her simple mission. You're probably wondering what that is. It's to inspire science-based happiness, passion, and purpose at work, home, and in everyday life. Now in 2010, Jen launched the Delivering Happiness book, which has sold almost 1 million copies worldwide and hit number one on bestsellers lists like the New York Times, USA Today, and the Wall Street Journal. After the book's launch, organizations around the world wanted to learn how to bring profits, passion, and purpose to their company cultures, but didn't know how to start. So Delivering Happiness, the company, was created. Since then, Jen has shared her expertise as a thought leader in culture, change, using principles from the science of happiness. Along with her 15 plus years of culture experience from Zappos and DH, to create profitable, sustainable cultures and organizations around the world. So we obviously have an excellent guest in Jen, and we are excited to have such an expert in the happiness field joining us today. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to the desk. And let's go ahead and dive right into today's conversation. So let's take a look at the agenda. First, we'll give you a snapshot of where employee needs are today and how that plays into their happiness. We'll discuss the importance of happiness and how it plays into the success of a business. We'll follow that up by taking a look at what goes into building a better organizational culture. Then we'll share some helpful tools and models for improving happiness. And finally, we'll go over how to better support employees and improve retention. Now, let's go ahead and get to the next slide and get some engagement going with everyone. We're gonna have a poll popping up on your screen. And that poll question is, what is your main goal for improving employee happiness? Is it to increase productivity and work ethic? Or maybe it's to improve mental health and well-being across the company? Or is it possibly to improve company culture and improve retention? Or maybe it's just to attract and retain top talent? Or is it just all of the above? Go ahead and take some time Look at those responses, think about which one is most applicable to you, and don't worry about other seeing your responses. These are totally anonymous. They will just give us some feedback to know what's happening in the workforce right now. While you're taking that time, I wanna go ahead and kick off our conversation and turning a question to you, Jen. We know employee happiness is crucial, that, that's just a given. But can you tell us why? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, especially given the last few years of major shifts in life and organizations, it really highlighted this simple equation that we've believed for a long time. And what our belief system is that if you have happier employees first, you'll have happier customers and you'll have a happier company in the sense of a more profitable, more sustainable business. But at the same time, what you're actually doing is creating more meaningful lives. And that's what I want to sort of like make sure everyone understands when we talk about happiness, it's not necessarily, you know, rainbows and unicorns type of happiness. It's actually the most sustainable form of happiness where we come back to meaning and having a sense of purpose and a fulfilling life. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think what I'm hearing here is not only is it going to benefit the um, person themselves, but also mm -hmm. it's going to play a role in the organization as well. Both are going to see success when employees are happy. Totally. Yep. I want to go ahead and close the poll now, everyone. Thank you for participating in that. We do have a couple more coming up, so please stay tuned for those and participate. But I want to go ahead and kick off our first section and, and get going. The current landscape and evolving needs of employees. So maybe more so now than ever before, employees know exactly what they want. And more importantly, they have higher expectations for how employers should be meeting those needs. Failing to understand our role in those employee needs can lead to unhappiness, also disengagement, as well as turnover. So Jen, the expert here, what are some reasons employees are disengaged and why is that happening and what has been happening with that disengagement over the past few years? Yeah, so what's interesting about the last few years um, is that everyone in the world got 2020. Futurists knew from way back when that th these things were going to happen, like whether it's pandemic, whether it's global recession, climate change, uh, you know, disruptive technology, uh, social unrest, you know, um, those things we all knew were coming, we just did not know in the same year. So that really thrusts us to a different place and we're all in the world kind of experiencing the same thing. So because we had the luxury of time because of, you know, having COVID and with the pandemic and with like being in Zoom land or wherever we were, uh, we had time to think. And a lot of people kind of reflected on where they were unhappy, why are they spending time in places they won't, don't, you know, want to, that are not prioritized in, in the most meaningful part of their lives. Um, and also because there's more choices. We all saw and felt what it me meant to be in a different kind of workplace and situation. And I think in the end of the day, a lot of us realize we weren't spending the minutes the way we want to. And so that directly leads to this whole notion of like, now that we've had the time, how can we find and, and prioritize our minutes so that we are focusing on our own fulfillment as well as the people we love and care about? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's probably important to note that, yes, it happened in 2020, but the, that mindset is sticking with us. And I don't mm -hmm. think it's going away anywhere. So as an organization, um, as HR, you need to take actions and measures put in place um, to address these things. Mm -hmm. um, that leads us perfectly to our next slide here, the importance of employee happiness and job satisfaction. So we commissioned a survey through Morning Consult this year to gauge employees. The survey uncovered a lot of insight into satisfied and dissatisfied employees or happy versus unhappy, depending on your preferred terminology. From that survey, one of the many findings was the fact that there are gaps in all factors between happy and unhappy employees. However, these are especially acute when it comes to self-fulfillment, company culture, manager support, and HR support. For instance, only 28% of unhappy employees in the survey said they were satisfied with their level of self-fulfillment and enjoyment in the workplace. A stark difference between the 88% of happy employees who said that they were satisfied in those areas. So you can tell there's a big difference here. And I want to know from your opinion, mm -hmm. are you surprised to see this large gap between happy and unhappy employees on the topic of self-fulfillment in the workplace specifically? Uh, not surprised at all, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Um, because we've been talking a lot about purpose and fulfillment for a long time, even before 2020. And the fact that um, everything just got highlighted and spotlighted in the last things, uh, a few years, just basically the covers are pulled and the reality was you know, more obvious than ever. So not surprised at all, but what I think is interesting about that stat is it's kind of like chicken and the egg too. Our, self-fulfilled people generally more happy or happy people generally more self-fulfilled. But I think the interaction of both is super important for us as leaders uh, in our companies to be able to uh, implement these things with that in mind, with both of them in mind as well. For sure. And I would start to think about the chicken and the egg thing. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, you know, regardless, they're both so important, you know, mm -hmm. and we need to address them. So whether or not we can figure that out, we've got to take some action here. Totally. So how personal happiness affects a business? You're probably wondering that. Well, improving happiness, engagement, and productivity numbers will require changes to organizational culture with the growing amount of career opportunities that there are right now in the modern day workforce businesses are becoming more competitive in compensation and benefits to better support employees. The morning consult survey shows people don't just want more money. They want a thoughtful work-life balance. They have to have that. They also found that the most important factor to job satisfaction among happy and unhappy employees 
was that good work-life balance. Moreover, according to data from Impulse, 87% of employees expect their employers to help balance work and life. So we're already hearing there's these expectations from the employees on the employer. In your opinion, Jen, should employers help employees balance work and life and why? Uh, well, the short answer is yes, of course, but just a caveat to the question, because we actually believe in not just work-life balance, we actually believe in work-life integration. In that sense that we, as human beings, if we're working, we're spending most of our waking time at the office with our coworkers, with our leaders. leaders. So if we look at it as a more holistic picture, then that's why our work-life integration comes in. And to the question of like whether employers should be focusing on this and prioritizing, the yes comes into what we've seen when leaders actually align people with their profits and their higher purpose, they actually have a longer trajectory of, of growth and sustainability, especially now in this very, very chaotic time. There's a lot of unknowns that we can't figure out. So if we sort of reframe that our people are not our expenses, our people are actually our assets. And if we invest in them, they'll invest in us, you know, blood, sweat, tears, hopefully more smiles. Uh, but it just makes sense all around for businesses and people alike. For sure. And as you talk about that alignment, one of the things that comes to mind is goal setting in an organization, whether that's personal or professional, um, making sure that you're in tune with your employees' goals and, and mm. hearing them out and aligning those professional ones to the organization so they know that they have um, a role to play in that organization. Absolutely. I think that goes a long way with engagement as well. Mm -hmm. uh, continuing this conversation, let's take a look at why happiness is good for business goals. Happy employees are not just good for productivity purposes. They're central to defining a healthy company culture, satisfying customers, and reducing turnover, which is a big cost. Gallup estimates that replacing an employee can cost as much as 200% of that employee's salary. When you factor in recruitment efforts, onboarding, training, and other procedural requirements, the time and effort is adding up. It's not only a big cost, but it's a real struggle today to retain employees. In the morning consult survey I've continued to reference, they found that across the board, half of workers are open to a new position. With 12% of all employees, all of employees, and 39% of unhappy employees specifically, actively searching. So that means on their lunch break after work, they're looking, seeing if the grass is greener somewhere else. I also wanna share that notably, 20% of those who recently changed jobs are actively looking. So that lets you know they're in your organization, you got them hired on, there's still a chance you could lose them. Within that first 30, 60, 90 days, they're still making up their decision as to whether or not your organization is the right fit for them. So it's a lot to think about. In your opinion, Jen, I wanna to turn to you. Mm -hmm. What is it that people are searching for and why is it so hard to find? Yeah, I think, I mean, those stats are so staggering, but uh, I think it's just going to essentially actually get worse if we're not addressing the root causes. And I think a part of the problem of searching is that people are not actually actively trying to do the work for themselves, ground themselves in their own purpose and values, understand what means everything to them. Because sometimes I think we all assume what happiness means or assume what fulfillment means without actually asking ourselves the hard questions of what is it that means everything in my purpose and how I wanna live my life and my values. And with that kind of work, that's when the people start searching because now they know with all these different options around them, whether it's different you know, workplaces or roles or job or responsibilities, at least they're grounded within themselves then they can actually get out into the workforce and actually understand in a better time, in a better way, what they are really seeking to be happy and be fulfilled. So I think it's really a matter of both sides, not just employers, but also employees need to do the work themselves as well for purpose and values alignment. Okay, so work needs to be done, mm -hmm. but you can't, you can't just say work needs to be done putting some effort in, putting first step forward. And I don't want to scare people off, you know, because it, it's it's not going to be just one and done. Rome wasn't built in a day type thing. This is going to take some effort. And so I hope everyone is tuned in and, and taking some notes here on Jen's thoughts. I want to continue and share that retention is certainly harder today than it was a few years ago. So again, it's not going to be easy, but the quality of the business environment plays a large role in that high turnover. So you should be paying attention to that area. Let's talk more about that environment and organizational culture that we've been mentioning. Moving to our next slide, what it takes to build a better organizational culture. 
every business has its own organizational culture that's supported through values and purpose. That culture plays a large part in employee happiness and retention. And what we found from Lexington Law, they conducted a survey and the results showed that 38% of employees want a job that aligned with their interests and passions. It's common today that people are looking for jobs where they can be happy. And a lot of that happiness depends on the culture. So Jen, can you explain what makes a great organizational culture in your opinion? There are so many different facets for a great organizational culture because it's so dynamic. And we can see it as a living, breathing organism, knowing that it will change over time and therefore we need to adapt with it. So a great organizational culture is adaptable. A great organizational culture actually lives and breathes its purpose and value. So they're not just you know pretty words on the wall or on the website. It actually listens a culture that listens for everyone to be felt like they're heard and understood, but also at the same time with great clarity in communication and direction from leadership. And at the end of the day, what I found most beneficial for cultures is that everyone in the building, so to speak, everyone in the organization, whether you're C-level or the receptionist, can answer this question, these two questions, which is, what's in it for me and what's in it for all? So knowing that everyone feels taken care of their needs, but also at the same time, they're looking out for the greater goal, which is if you don't have an organization that exists and survives and, and sustainable, be sustainable over time, then there's no organization to be a part of. So having a more communal, more village type thinking that, yes, of course, I have my needs, but we're going to do this together with everyone. Yeah, that's excellent. And I, I like from that of definition that you're sharing and your thoughts that there's a, a good mix of intentionality as well as an organic feel to it too, you know, because they're going to have that piece where just natural culture comes in. But mm -hmm. if leadership is putting the intention toward building the type of culture that fits that organization, you're going to get that perfect mesh. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure we have some attendees wondering now, how do we build happiness? So trying to prevent employee burnout has always been challenging for businesses and those alike. According to Gallup, 76% of employees experience burnout on the job at some point. And an alarming 28% say they are burned out very often or always at work. With workers today feeling more burnt out than ever before, offering the right support in the right areas is vital to employee happiness and wellness. Burnout is also a leading cause for disengagement which is typically the final move before an employee quits. Now, Jen, how do we fully support employee happiness in order to avoid burnout and disengagement? Yeah, I mean, that talking about, as we talked about earlier, like pulling over the covers of what already existed with that level of burnout and, and disengagement, and now we know how high those levels are. It's the number one, actually, uh, factor in terms of disengagement is burnout. So I think what I have learned over the years, especially in the last few, is that it's not just about happiness, it's actually about wholeness. It's bringing it to another level of knowing that, yeah, of course we'll have our highs in life, in life highs in life as a, as a company, as an individual, but we also will have our lows. And that's where the wholeness comes in. If we as leaders can actually respect that as individuals, we're gonna have those highs and lows. So we have an exercise we call the happiness heartbeats. And basically what that helps people do is like help them define or redefine or reframe what happiness means in a holistic way. So essentially thinking through your life of like what were those high moments, but at the same time thinking through your life of your low moments and learning from them. And if you actually map those things out and ask yourself what values were there or, or not there, uh, what people were there or not there, you'll start seeing patterns of what you personally feel most whole and happy in your life. And that's, I think, where we have to be respectful of so that we can actually address burnout and disengagement at, at a realistic level. Yeah, that's an excellent um, exercise to share. I think the next thing that came to mind was, oh, this is the work. This is the work that you're talking <laughs> right. about. You've got to ask these questions. So thank you for sharing your thoughts there. Mm -hmm. And now let's continue on and talk about adapting to the future. Employees are prioritizing their happiness and looking to HR and business leaders to satisfy needs. And that's a lot of pressure. And let's be honest, most of that pressure is gonna fall on HR shoulders. To help meet all of these needs, there has been a rising trend in HR technology that can automate the more tedious tasks such as payroll and allow HR to focus on fulfilling some of the more complicated needs of their employees. We've got to keep looking at the data from our morning consult survey because it's very eye-opening. 
we have a couple more findings on the slide. So taking a look on the left, 98% of employees think being paid on time and correctly are by far, by far the most important supports. While about 90% of employees who recently changed jobs also want help understanding benefits and learning new skills. So this is employees that we're talking to here sharing uh, their firsthand experience of what it is exactly that they want. I know a lot of employees, you know, if you were to look across the United States are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm. So hearing about that payroll piece, um, they want to be paid on time, they don't want errors in their checks, they wanna have insight early, um, so that way they can plan their bills, especially for those hourly and uh, uh, workers or those who have variable wages. Having that insight and making sure that they spend within their means is gonna go a long way for them. Uh, but these are just some areas where tech can automate and streamline processes, freeing up time to help HR. Again, it goes back to HR. They don't need to be spending their time doing things that are manual, paperwork, paper pushing, that's not where they are. They're heart is with people and you need to get them in a place in your organization where they can be devoting it to the people. So I want to know, Jen, how do you see technology being used to improve employee happiness? Yeah, I mean, technology has such a bad rap, right? <laughs> Whether it's about social media or like yet another app that we have to learn and have to deal with. But I just always want to remind that technology is created to be an enabler. Technology should, in, in effect, be our friend. And that's why it's so important to go back to the purpose and value things I was talking about. Because when you know who you are and you're grounded it, you're no longer tethered or pulled by technology, you know, advancement, innovation, all that, because you're grounded in who you are. And then therefore, you can actually use technology for what it's worth. Okay, thank you for sharing those thoughts there. I want to continue and talk about the hierarchy of employee needs. You know, we've mentioned some stats from surveys. You've shared some information about what employees are wanting. But let's look specifically at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what Maslow's is, it contains five levels of human need that enable someone to feel fulfilled. And this hierarchy is often applied in the workplace by management in an effort to better motivate their employees. A big way that companies try to meet the needs of their employees is through additional benefits that take care of others' needs outside of the workplace. What do you think, Jen, I want to know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. and can it be applied to ensure employees' needs are met? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this question because I actually did some research on this for the book that I just launched uh, on Maslow's hierarchy because it has been such a huge, uh, like, instrumental sort of framework to think about lives, to think about how we can actually support our lives and, and others. But what was really interesting that most people don't know is that before he passed away, he actually added one more layer at the very top, which is above self-actualization. And what he said was there's actually the, the, the highest pinnacle of the hierarchy of needs is actually uh, tr transcendence is what he calls it. And transcendence is when you're not just self-actualizing yourself, you're actually helping others self-actualize too. So I thought that was really interesting and, and sort of like parallel to what's in it for me and what's in it for all. And another thing about Maslow's hierarchy that's different from where it was decades ago is that it's no longer hierarchical. It's actually a spectrum and it's a dynamic one. So as an example, someone, and I've met many people like this, that don't have all their physiological needs met can actually be more self-actualized than someone that has all the physiological needs, all the money in the world, but yet not completely self-actualized. So I think it's important to remember that it's a, it's a dynamic spectrum and therefore that's how you know complex but also beautiful it can be. For sure. I, I love how you added that extra layer there. I think it puts um, a good full picture on what it is that we need to understand about Maslow's and it ties in well here to our topic. So I want to continue on and now look at our last topic in the section, which is authenticity <clears throat> and leadership. So I want to discuss one more finding from the survey we've been covering. Among those who think support for managers is important, they feel the most vital types of support involve assistance with problem solving, help with mistakes, and recognition of accomplishments. Both happy and unhappy employees look to leadership to take a stake and interest in their success. Tiny Pulse found that the majority of employees feel their level of trust with senior management is directly connected to their satisfaction. One of the best ways leaders gain the trust of their employees is by backing up their words with actions. And to quote David W. Ballard, the director of the American Psychological Association's Center for Organizational Excellence, he says, when supervisors' actions match their words, employees notice. 
So Jen, in your experience, mm. how important is the role leadership plays in delivering happiness to their employees? Mm, it's uh, just, I can't even de describe how critical it is because it's, it's basically walking the talk. I mean, you can spend so many resources, so much investment in describing your culture, describing your values, describing your behaviors, but if the leaders are not actually actively living it, why would anyone else be incented to do that as well? Right, that's great advice, live authentically, and I think that's a perfect place to put a pin in the conversation here and go ahead and launch another poll for you all. Again, we love this engagement, so the question we're wondering is, do you feel your organizational culture needs to change its values and purpose? The responses there are yes, no, somewhat, or I'm not sure. Again, feel free to answer honestly, wherever you fall within those answers, it will help us better understand what's happening in organizations. But I wanna give you some time to respond to that question and we'll turn one to you, Jen. If a company is going to update its purpose and values, where should it start? Uh, this has been an ever evolving kind of question, but I think because especially what happened in the last few years, we always recommend start with you start with the me, start with the individual. If you're a leader thinking about this and considering it for your whole organization or for just your team or your function, try doing it for yourself first. And then you can actually experience what it means to do these exercises, work on yourself, understand your highs and lows, understand your purpose and values of how you wanna live at work and life. And if you're doing it truly authentically to who you are, not your work self or your life self, but your, as we say, weird authentic self, then you begin to understand the value of it that brings to you. And then you can understand if, just imagine, you know, everyone in your group, everyone in your team or organization did the same thing, how powerful that can be. Because people are being, showing up there as their real selves and they're also seeing how they are more similar than not. And that's where the power come in, comes in. Yeah, and I can just think about how powerful it is to be your weird self, you know, <laughs> because you don't have to put any effort into be who you are, but you do sometimes have to put in an effort to kind of change, you know, yourself in those areas. So I'm sure that will uh, do release some of the stress that you might have from mm -hmm. feeling like you need to put on a show or a front or whatever it is. So good points there that you can bring your authentic self to work and, and that we um, should be promoting that in the organization. Yeah. I want to go ahead and close the poll now, everyone. Thank you for participating in that. Tools and models that can help stabilize and build happiness. It's easier to point out unhappiness than it is to turn it around. Not to mention the bigger the company is, the more its culture and values seem to be set in stone, making any changes feel sometimes nearly impossible. So when it comes to established companies, what's needed for them to realign or change up their values in your opinion, Jen? Yeah, what I really like about this question is that this is most of us. <laughs> We're all in some sort of company that's not a startup. Uh, so what I think is most important here is that even if, you know, ideal world, of course, is leadership at every level is wanting that change and wants to buy in and really align authentically with purpose and values. Realistically, that's not always the case. So what we've seen work really well is for subgroups, whether it's like one single team or maybe a cross-functional team that really believe in wanting to work differently and operate under a new sense of uh, purpose and values. And sometimes what works is like use existing purpose and values as guides, not necessarily rules or mandates, but basically ask yourself, are, is this still our purpose? Is this still our living purpose? Is, are these values, are we, really, are we living by these and behaviors? Are we li really living by them right now too? And then if you can start in that small circle and actually sh show the results, show the metrics as, as to why people are being more productive, why they're more engaged, why they're showing up more, why they're happier. There's no good leader that will say, stop being that, stop being happy and more productive and more engaged. And that's when you get buy-in across. Excellent, and the end goal there is definitely buy-in. So mm -hmm. thanks for that advice. And I want to go ahead now, um, we're gonna talk about the will of wholeness. I know you've talked about wholeness a bit here, Jen, but we're gonna get to that and dive in with some questions for you. But when we start to consider the entirety of a person's life, interests, goals, and all of the highs and lows, we start to look at their happiness in a holistic way. 
And that's achieved through a combination of several key areas. And I want to ask, Jen, you have this a tool called Will of Wholeness that can help employees feel fulfilled and increase their happiness. Do you mind telling us more about this will and how it's used? Go ahead and elaborate on that, please. Yeah, so how do you actually put these things in place? You know, when you're talking about wholeness, talk about humanity, they seem really lofty. But what we really like to do is make it practical. So Wheel of Wholeness is introducing this idea of every single person was seen with this Wheel of Wholeness so that they're not just seen for their role or their responsibility or their skill set, but the Wheel of Wholeness expands it to who they are as a human being. So what we add to it, if you imagine, and you can see those, you know, pie pieces of the bigger pie is we're adding mentality or where they are in their mental space. Uh, we're also adding things like emotional space, uh, physical space, relational space with people that they connect with, and of course, ultimately, even financial space too, and ultimately higher purpose or spiritual space. So when you see each person as their whole self, then they feel heard, then they feel understood. And if everyone in the organization felt that way, then you actually have a greater culture and a more bondedness to achieve those higher purpose and, and values and, and make it a more sustainable company. All right, thank you for sharing that. And I love that we have the, um, to go with what you said, we do have the visual there on the slide. And I wanna continue on because you do have tools and models that can help uh, in companies in this area, people in this area. So moving on to our next slide, the personal greenhouse model. Every person experiences highs and lows and to achieve happiness and wholeness, there needs to be some kind of support system in place that can be there for the entire journey. So you have something called this personal greenhouse model that you mentioned in your book, Beyond Happiness. Can you give us an overview of what that is and how it works? Sure, yeah. So it is personal at the individual level, but it's also important to remember, especially as a leader, that this is this model can be applied to the organization as well. So teams and the greater organization at large. But what this model is doing is basically visualizing all the things that we've been talking about so that it can be lived in an easier, like no brainer type of way. So what we have on the bottom there, which is the foundation of the what, is your per oh, sorry, your values and behaviors. So when you go through these exercises and define your values, like for example, mine are an independence, authenticity, and relationships, then you have a bit better understanding of how you can make decisions in your life and why it's more important for you because at the top of the model is higher purpose. So define and don't, don't make this a daunting thing. What might your higher purpose be? So in the middle of that pyramid are basically the greenhouse elements. And those are the things that are sandwiched by the higher purpose and, and, and values and behaviors. Because in the end, this is what you're personally gaining out of it, which is a sense of autonomy or control, a sense of progress and growth and development, and a sense of connectedness in meaningful connections. So that's why it's so important to have those things because that comes to, uh, equates to your ultimate happiness and fulfillment. On the right side is what we call the me, we community model. And this is to reflect how we are all interconnected. So like we saw, said earlier, we start with the me, your individual purpose and values, and then that ripples out to the we, which is your team, your company at large, and then your community, which are your customers, your partners, your vendors, everyone that's in your ecosystem. And then you can see how they all are aligned in terms of if everyone had that sense of purpose and values, it could ripple out to essentially having a greater sense of, you know, uh, alignment with with your customers and your teammates. So that's the model where it starts with me and it ripples out to how it can impact in positive ways your customers and your ecosystem. Great, thank you for sharing that. I think it's a good picture to pair with what's on the slide there. We've now made it to our last section, how to better support your workforce and improve retention. A big part of keeping employees on the payroll and happy comes back to culture. So Jen, in your experience, what's the number one mistake that businesses make with their organizational culture? Yeah, I would say that there's two things that go hand in hand. It's when they have a stated culture, but they're not really living it on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's so many organizations that have so many things outlined in their values and behaviors, but even when, they, when leaders aren't living it, and they're, you know, so therefore people in the whole organization aren't. What's very closely tied to that is lack of commitment. So that's the mistake of, of leaders when they invest in these things. They think it's a one and done deal and, you know, launching new values or whatever it might be, but they realize that it's 
that doesn't really lead to long-term gain. That's just like a short-term splash, but not true value in the end. So the second mistake is a lack of commitment to the long-term gain of the of, of culture and people. Okay, yeah, thank you for sharing both of those. I can definitely see easily how those could be something that would be a mistake for an organization to make, and, and hopefully you're hearing it here to avoid those things. I want to continue on to talk about creating a better culture through dialogue. So in case anyone is questioning the importance of culture in regards to happiness and retention, our morning consult survey found that 88% of happy employees cite good company culture as an area where their current job meets their expectations. One important part of organizational culture is communication. What the Society for Human Resource Management found is that 53% of working Americans who have left a job due to workplace culture report leaving of their organization because of their relationship with their manager. So when a business needs to revisit or start over with its culture, what should it do when you have things like managers being a, a point of leaving and the culture being a point, what can you do? Yeah, I think uh, one key thing to remember is it seems like such a daunting task, but just break it into chunks. And the first step is always, in terms of being most effective and having high effectiveness, is to listen. Sometimes we think and assume too much about what we think you know, our team or our company needs. But if we actually go on, on a listening tour, and part of that listening tour is asking uh, really simple questions. And for me, it's asking every single person so that they feel heard and understood what's in it for me, and what's in it for all. And so it's not basically, it turns it from a venting session to a dirty laundry session, like not all the negativity that come up, can come, excuse me. It turns it from like a negative session to a positive one. So it's not about, you know, venting and then have, you know, sharing your dirty laundry. It's about building together and co-creating what that solution can be. So if you ask those two questions in a way that is generative and additive for the greater goal of change, that's where I would start. Okay, the good places are. Thank you for sharing that. And as we wrap things up, we're going to close by discussing striving for more happiness. We've mentioned now happy employees equal happy customers equal happy business. This is the idea here that we're carrying forward. But the wellness factor cannot be understated as an important piece of delivering happiness to employees. Poor mental health is one of the biggest reasons millennials and Gen Zers are leaving their roles. The Harvard Business Journal found that across all industries in 2021, 68% of millennials and 81% of Gen Zers left their jobs for mental health reasons. So where do you think happiness and wellness intersect, Jen? Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, basically two big pieces of the greater pie. Uh, when you ask that kind of question, I automatically think about Simone Biles and the fact of what she did, her workplace happened to be on an international stage. And what she did was she gave the world a favor by saying, no, I'm not gonna do this because I'm taking care of myself. And being able to introduce that sense of mental health into her workplace on the global stage, I think it reminded everyone that we can do that too. And that's why I think where happiness is and, and wellness is and well-being, whatever you wanna call it, it's a greater umbrella of humanity. There's three words that are so important now more than ever for each other uh, in the workplace, which is, are you okay? And it, those three words have done wonders as to make sure you're not assuming because everyone at the end of the day has some sort of battle, some sort of intrigue of lowness in their life they, that you might not be aware of. So bringing that sort of empathy and humanity to the workplace actually will bond us more than ever with purpose and meaning. Uh, and that's how I see us surviving and thriving in this future of work that's happening right now. For sure, and as I hear you talk about humanity, I'm reminded that we all have to remember that we're all human mm -hmm. and we're gonna go through human things. And so we have to have some grace there as well. So I wanna have a follow-up for you, Jen. What's the most important thing businesses and leaders need to keep in mind mm -hmm. when working towards happiness and community in the workplace? What should be in the back of their mind? Uh, I think a couple things. Number one is it's not a checkbox. Okay. Can't just say, hey, we got happiness and humanity, we're done. Uh, and the other thing, because it's so integrated into our everyday society. When you think about it, every headline that comes up in our newsfeed, whether it's in war in Ukraine, whether it's inflation, whether it's a new you know, variant of, of, of a, a pandemic or a disease of a virus, these things reside in our back of our minds as human beings. So as leaders, 
thinking about happiness and humanity, not separate, but all integrated and inclusive of all the decisions we're making from strategy to brand to culture, that it's all one and the same. All right, excellent, everyone. I hope you were jotting those notes down of what to keep in mind. Let's go ahead and move on and recap now. So we have covered a lot of great information today and we talked about the state of employee needs and the importance of employee happiness to a business and to the person. We also covered what goes into organizational culture and some tools and models for improving employee happiness and satisfaction. And then finally, we covered where to start when looking at adding support for employees and improving your retention rates. So again, we have covered a lot today, but what's the next step from here, Jen? Can you give us your recommendations for where or how to get started improving employee happiness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of, just kind of recapping of what we've been talking about. There's been a lot of great questions and, and then what crest to the top for me still is the best next step is to understand like, well, number one, do you believe in this? Do you believe that you wanna be living your best lives just as much as everyone else in your team or organization does? Then if you believe in that, go, uh, go about with that listening tour and really ask and make sure they feel heard and understood. With that kind of information, that is so rich in terms of like what you think should be done versus what could be done. And then you'll actually be prioritizing in the right way. So I think that the whole listening tour exercise is probably the most meaningful thing to do, especially because people are visiting, what does it mean to be happy anymore? What does it mean to be fulfilled? This is uh, a differentiator for you as a leader and a company. For sure. And I can't help but think about technology here too. It's so easy to listen. Uh, you can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. I think exit interviews, stay interviews are mm -hmm. good for an organization, but also just taking the pulse with technology, surveying your employees. Mm -hmm. But one thing we have to remember is that it's good to listen, but you have to provide that feedback. You know, if I'm an employee and I'm sharing my thoughts with you and then I, I see nothing come of it or I don't see any change whatsoever, I'm going to be probably in a worse place mm -hmm. than I was when you started talking to me. 100%. So it, it's a big piece to have that feedback there. So I love that you um, were able to recap that for us. Thank mm -hmm. you. Now, let's go ahead and take a quick poll before we get into our Q&A. We do have some questions we're going to pull for Jen to take for you all. So with that poll, we have talked a little bit about technology today and earlier and how it can help employee happiness and how it can help you personally as an organization, as HR professionals. Um, Paycom has tools in place that will allow you as HR to get tedious tasks off your plate, to put programs in place, put learning technology in place that's going to help your organization um, understand and hear and train your organization on what they need in this area, whether it's diversity and inclusion or mental health and wellness, all of those things Paycom can help you with. Additionally, you might be thinking about benefits. If you're wondering about what benefits are a good fit for your organization, because those have changed in the last few years, the perks that people are wanting we talked about people wondering if the grass is greener on the other side. Well, benefits are something that they're looking for. And so we have, again, the tools to help you there. I want to go ahead and uh, ask that question, though. Would you like a personalized demo of Paycom products related to this webinar? Yes or no? And we know every organization is different, and you're going to have specific organizational needs, and you might be spread out across the U.S., or you might be in one home base, or you might be all remote. Again, Paycom has the tools that can help you with that, but we want to get on the line with you and know what it is that you need and then talk through for the best solution for you. So take some time and think, of that, think about that response, yes or no. Please submit your answers when you know it. But I want to turn a question to you, Jen, to give everyone a, a chance to respond there. What's the most important thing businesses and leaders need to keep in mind when working towards happiness and humanity in the workplace? Yeah, I think we touched upon that uh, a couple times, but just to recap that, it's definitely just remember that it's not a checkbox, that it's part of the integrated whole, that we are approaching it because this is our one life to live. So how do we want to live that meaningfully? And I think just to build on that, just also remember the more real you are, the more authentic you are, the more others will be as well. So showing those signs of vulnerability, showing that empathy will is actually contagious. <laughs> Happiness is also contagious too. But I think as leaders, as we approach this like seemingly daunting thing, the more we can be true to ourselves, the more people will show up and be true to themselves too. Absolutely. 
I want to know in terms of technology, you mentioned earlier about technology can be your friend. Mm -hmm. What can that look like in the workplace? What, what should that look like? Um, talk us through how you can defeat the mindset of, you know, technology is bad and that it is your friend. And on uh, an additional question, there's a lot of employers who might think, hey, I don't have a very tech savvy workforce, or maybe I have a, a big segment who's not tech savvy. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about overcoming some of those tech challenges, maybe. Yeah, and, and I think part of the, the complexity of it all is because there's so many options. But I think for clarity and simplicity, what we can all do as individuals and leaders for our companies is ask the question, why? So if we can help answer the question, why, for ourselves, and therefore those that are maybe not as tech savvy or just kind of resistant to change or resistant to technology, if you tell them the why, then they understand. It's like, it's supposed to help you. If it's not helping you, tell us why and we'll help fix it. But I think um, to kind of like just get everything under a handle in terms of like understanding the needs is going back to the why and how it impacts individual, the me, and of course the we as an organization. Excellent, thank you for sharing those thoughts. And attendees, thank you for taking time to respond to that poll. I wanna go ahead and close that out now and get going in that Q&A section. Uh, I wanna pull the first question here. So Jen, what's the hardest part about helping organizations improve employee happiness? I think, oh gosh, you know, over the last 10 plus years of being organizational change and happiness, we've seen so many different uh, challenges come up. But I think, I think it's the mindset of what happiness can be. Knowing that there's always going to be naysayers, and uh, sometimes it's like I don't want like rainbows and unicorns in my workplace. It's not what it's about. But the reality is that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what's most meaningful to the individual. And if anything, it's like holding up a mirror of what's important to you and making it more like a selfish thing. It's not like a happiness thing for all what's most important to you. So I think that mental barrier is challenging, but once they experience the difference, then it gets so much easier. Excellent. Good to hear that it does get easier there. <laughs> Excellent. And I want to pull this next one out looks like this probably came during our demo question. So can I use Paycom to survey my employees to get information? Um, absolutely. I'll go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> you can get confidential insights um, and it will help you gauge whether it's company culture or you put a new initiative in place. That tool can help you. So for sure, I hope that answered your question. I'll put this next one for you, Jen. How do I get the ball rolling on updating my company's culture? How do I get my executive team buy-in? So just some advice for them. Yeah, I think, you know, just to recap what we touched about there in terms of uh, how do we get the ball rolling? What's the next step? Listening to her, asking the question, what's in it for me? What's in it for all? Implementing the wheel of wholeness so that people know that we're in a different time. So we want to know who they are as a whole person. And then executive buy-in is, uh, of course, the critical next step to, to scale. And I kind of mentioned this earlier. If you don't have it yet, carve out your success of what it could look like. Maybe it's your team, immediate team. Maybe it's a cross-functional team. But basically, who are those people that are real, really will, wanting and wanting and willing to do the work of purpose and values? And then identify your metrics. What does the exec team care about? Is it retention? Is it profit? Is it sales? Is it all of the above? But be very clear as to, hey, because we're doing this, these exercises, we've got this much in, ter in terms of return on investment, but also return on on purpose to rippling an impact. Perfect, all right. We've got time to keep pulling some more questions. So this next one is, what is the biggest thing that you've learned in the last six months? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be related to today's topic, I'm yeah. sure. But what, what have you taken away or, or what's a nugget that you can share with our audience members? Um, I think the biggest thing, because I mean, we're still sort of in the wake of, you know, the pandemic's still here, but I think 2022, what's been different with that than the 2020 and 2021 is that there has been a slight opening towards more hope. And once you have a big a shift from where we were of just like unknown uncertainty, kind of despair, like when is this all going to end? When 2022 ro rolled around, we saw more glimmers of people understanding or wanting to embrace all that happened and wanting to build to something more. So I think that was the the biggest sort of highlight for me is like, let's 
make the most of this time, you know, knowing there's going to be a lot of lows still, but let's make the most of our, this time for ourselves, for the people we love, for our teams and organizations. So I'm therefore optimistic now. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, and I think just due to the past few years, I think people probably uh, hopefully are, are becoming more optimistic of taking advantage of the time that we have now because it is so precious. And we have a finite amount of time that we're guaranteed. And so you've really got to take some action and, and put your best foot forward. Jen, I think we have time to pull maybe one or two more questions here. So this next one, um, it says, if I'm going to read your new book, what is a nugget that I will learn? Hmm. <laughs> Hopefully the more than one nugget. But <laughs> <laughs> What's the best name for this person? They, they have high hopes. Yeah. Uh, so I guess um, the title in itself uh, didn't come to me till I was done at the very end. So Beyond Happiness was something of like what people are asking like what's what's beyond like i'm just trying to be happy so i think the nugget is that you know these questions that we're talking about like what workplace or life um i think it provides a broader sense of how to live a meaningful life today and something i talk about is a living legacy not the legacy that exists when you're gone so i think in terms of like these big ideas, whether it's purpose or values or, you know, your legacy you want to leave, uh, I think, I hope it boils down the nuggets of being what's beyond happiness and actually living for today. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And let's take one more question and then we will close out here and then we will provide you um, some credit codes. But again, we have one more question we're going to get to here. The question is organizationally or for my personal self, how can I measure happiness and gauge the success of initiatives that I'm putting in place? So the question is, how can you measure happiness? Okay. Um, so that there, I think it's two pronged. I think there's, I mean, we we are also a big part of like measurement stats and stories we believe in. So the two pronged approach is leverage your existing data, leverage what you're already measuring, and then add to it. Um, now that we know, because happiness is a science, and there's actually um, specific kind of questions that we can ask people to gauge where they are in terms of their happiness. If you have both of those kind of metrics, then you can see like the tens or the trends of whether or not if your this team is happier, then are they performing better in different metrics that are already existing. So I'm really big about not reinventing the wheel, but asking the right questions. And now we need to ask ask different ones that are more holistic, more about the whole being, and then basically see the trends and how it affects their performance and you know things that we already, already measure like profit and et cetera. Perfect. Yeah, I think the last piece there, you throwing it in with, with profit, I mean, because it plays a role in an organization. So why not treat it just mm -hmm. like all these other metrics that we have? So thanks for sharing that. And as we wind down, I just want to remind you again, Paycom has you covered. We have helpful tools. You can see there on the slide, uh, our suite. You can use them on a tablet, on a phone, on a desktop, whatever it is. Again, we have uh, Paycom surveys, Paycom learning, our payroll tool, Betty, the all help you uh, in your journey and success. With that, let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. On this slide, you should be able to see the certification codes for this presentation. The HRCI code is 593449, and the SHRM code is 22-9RB94. So take some time and jot those down. Let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. And this is just to tell you that we have a lot of great resources and content to offer you for attending our webinar. So check out those links we've provided. Additional resources can be found at paycom.com, including other webinars, white papers, and case studies. And one of those great resources is our blog. With thousands of subscribers, our blog is dedicated to empowering employers with the latest compliance, HR, and payroll-related news including ways to engage your largest asset, like we've talked about, your employees. So feel free to check out those anytime. And then as this final slide states, we do have a podcast, HR Breakroom, and that is another great resource. HR Breakroom is a dedicated podcast to having quick conversations on the hot topics in HR and HR technology, one cup of coffee at a time. The episode link for today is Workplace Culture, Q&A with Adam Grant. And this episode answers questions about creating resilient workplace culture. So if you're in the mood to listen, to continue your journey, and, and you want to consume 
more content, check out that link. And with that, we do want to remind you, you can always go to paycom.com forward slash HR break room to find that or any of your um, favorite podcast listening apps. We hope you had a lot to take away today. I want to thank you, Jen, for joining the conversation. We appreciated you coming out, joining us in the studio, sharing everything about happiness. I also want to thank our attendees. We appreciated you taking an hour out of your day to sit down and listen and hear how you can improve your organization. We hope to see you back on another Paycom webinar soon. Have a great day.